So in the last class, uh, as a part of critical care medicine, we discussed about the sepsis and the septic shock. So today, uh, let me take a very important and in fact, the initial topic of the critical medicine that is shock. <clears throat> One of the very important and controversial uh, issue as usual in the part of emergency medicine. A very important thing is to, you should know to identify the patient in shock. If you don't able to, if you're not able to identify when the patient is in shock, then it's of no use. After identifying when the patient is whether the patient is in shock or not, then only it depends which type of shock, what treatment is possible. All these comes only after you just identify the patient is in shock. So to understand it, you, you, you should know what is shock, etc. So uh, it's a very, very confusing. Uh, a topic uh, very easy to read in any of the uh, internet based textbook or any textbook it's very easy there are just some classifications and they mention this happens in this type of shock this happens in this type of shock these are the causes and this is how you treat but when you are actually exposed in the emergency medicine and the patient is in front of you is dying then it becomes a very very important topic to identify that the patient is in shock so uh, let us be uh, practical uh, here. Uh, first, uh, let us go to a case discussion, then uh, we will answer it in the last. So here it was a 54-year-old man who was brought to the emergency department overnight following a motor vehicle accident. Although he was found neurologically intact, his examination of head and extremities was largely unremarkable. An ultrasound of the abdomen revealed a free fluid in the abdomen. For that, he went underwent a laparotomy for a ruptured spleen. He is not otherwise known uh, to have any significant past medical history. And up until last night, he had been in his usual state of health, even after the surgery, and there is no notable family history. In the post-operative recovery course, he was unremarkable until the mid-morning, then about five years after his operation. He is found to be less responsive, with a blood pressure which was dropping from 136 by 90 to 89 by 55 and an increase in heart rate to 121 with a temperature of 38.1 with increased oxygen needs. And on physical examination, his abdomen was soft, his dressings were dry and capillary refill was normal. His skin is warm to touch. His EKG indicates a sinus rhythm unchanged from his baseline. The stat labs are drawn and the first result is his blood uh, gas lactate, which was elevated from two hours ago. He rapidly deteriorates with the disseminated intravascular coagulation. So which type of shock would you consider most probable in this scenario? Whether he's in a hypovolemic shock, whether he's in a cardiogenic shock, whether he's in a septic shock, whether he's in an epileptic shock, or he's in neurogenic shock. So we'll wait for your answer. So. This journey of approach to shock, uh, it actually very complicated. It does not appear as simple as it is, but let me make it a very simple thing. So what is a shock? You should understand. Shock is not a simple thing. Shock is a life-threatening condition. And what happens in shock is your tissues are not receiving the perfusion. So it is a state of altered tissue perfusion in which there is an imbalance between the supply and demand of the oxygen. So basically your cells and the tissues are devoid of the oxygen due to altered tissue perfusion. The problem is in the tissue perfusion here due to the imbalance between the supply and demand. Either demand is more or the supply is less. And for all the practical purpose, shock means the supply is less. The demand is more or when the, when the cells cannot utilize the enough oxygen, then it becomes a different type of hypoxia here. We are discussing here the type of the alteration in the tissue perfusion, which is not able to supply the enough oxygen to your tissues and cells. So this one occurs, this occurs as a part of failure in the circulation. So there is a circulatory failure, which is manifested as hypotension from the very, very important uh, and uh, very last uh, issue in case of shock. Whereas, very important thing it is uh, to recognize that the patient when he is in shock, he can be either hypertensive, he can be either normotensive, or he can be even hypotensive. 
So hypotension is not synonymous with shock. This is the first thing you should learn in this class. Hypotension is not equivalent to shock. Shock can occur with a normal blood pressure. Shock can even occur with increased blood pressure. This is one of the very, very important and interesting thing to understand here. Because the, the drop in the blood pressure in a patient of a shock appears in a decompensated state. So you should understand or you should identify the patients without uh, them progressing into decompensation. Only in the early stage of high, uh, shock, without uh, before developing the hypotension, if you can identify the management becomes uh, very, very easy in this patient. So in simple terms, if you want to understand shock, as I told you, it is a life-threatening condition of an altered tissue perfusion due to mismatch in the supply and demand. So in simple terms, it is an inadequate delivery of oxygen to your tissues. So what is this delivery of oxygen means or what on it depends on? You might have learned this particular formula in physiology. So your delivery of oxygen depends on the cardiac output and the concentration of artery, sorry, concentration of oxygen in the arterial blood. So this being determined by the hemoglobin, the saturation and the PaO2. So if you think here, what all by what all means your delivery of oxygen to the tissues depends on. So your delivery of oxygen to the tissues depends on cardiac output. The delivery of oxygen depends on the hemoglobin concentration. It depends on the oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin you have. And it depends on the environmental partial pressure of the oxygen. So where is the blood pressure here? So blood pressure is not there in the equation directly. So that's why the shock is not equivalent to hypotension. This is the first thing you should understand. The delivery of oxygen depends on the cardiac output, the hemoglobin concentration, the oxygen saturation, and the partial pressure. <clears throat> the blood pressure is not directly involved in delivering the oxygen. So patients can have inadequate oxygen delivery even with normal blood pressure. So the line here is the shock can be associated with the low blood pressure, but shock is not defined by low blood pressure. So don't tell that the patient uh, is in shock just by seeing the blood pressure. I will give you a simple example here. For example, a patient who is a hypertensive, his baseline BP is 150 by 90. He, have a, he has a history of trauma. He bleeds suddenly and he comes to you. He may have a blood pressure of 110 by 60. So even though patient is not hypertensive, the drop in the blood pressure is almost 40. So even at this level of blood pressure, the patient can be in shock. And another scenario is, you might have uh, seen many patients, especially the Indian patients, especially the females, whose baseline blood pressure itself is 90 by 60. And who keep, he keep on telling me repeatedly that I have low blood pressure, I have low blood pressure. So this is not a low blood pressure. This is her baseline or his baseline blood pressure. Similarly, a patient of a state of chronic vasodilatation, like cirrhosis of liver. Cirrhosis is the state of vasodilatation, especially the splanchnic vasodilatation. So due to that, the patients uh, usually have a lesser amount of blood pressure. So they usually have 90 by 60, etc. chronically, and they are not in shock. And similarly, a patient of uh, compensated severe heart failure whose ejection fraction is less than 25 percent is not able to uh, generate the blood pressure his baseline blood pressure itself is 90 systolic so then these patients are not considered to be in shock so that's why the basic funda is hypotension is not shock shock can be associated with hypertension but shock cannot be determined only by hypotension so basically what we want in our patients is we want an enough tissue oxygenation. The tissue delivery of oxygen should be normal. So this depends on the cardiac output to the larger extent. Plus it depends on the hemoglobin. Plus it depends on the saturation of the oxygen. Plus it depends on the partial percentage of the oxygen. 
So if you leave these two apart, because this is a separate part of discussion, the cardiac output is the major determinant and it comes to the tissue oxygenation. Provided your hemoglobin is normal, your saturation is normal, your partial pressure of oxygen is normal. So this cardiac output is basically determined by uh, three important things that you might have studied in your physiology, that is cardiac inotropy, the cardiac chronotropy, and the cardiac leucotropy. So any abnormality in these three can cause a shock. So how you will classify shock is uh, interesting classification is the shock is basically classified into four or five varieties of classification. One is the distributive kind of shock. Another is cardiogenic shock, the hypovolemic shock, and the obstructive shock. Another variety is mixed shock. where there are more than two uh, different mechanisms working in the patient in causing shock. So overall, for the entrance point of view, the most common cause of type of shock is the distributive shock. Although there is controversy between whether it is a hypovolemic shock or a distributive shock, for all the MCQ purposes, even the recent guidelines, uh, the recent uh, up-to-date also mentions the most common type of shock is the distributive shock and most common cause of shock is sepsis. Whereas cardiogenic shock is the most lethal, including the obstructive shock. The mortality has been very high with the cardiogenic shock and obstructive shock. And hypovolemic shock is pretty good one. The mortality is lesser in hypovolemic shock. So if at all the god appears in front of you and asks you which type of shock you want, tell him that you want hypovolemic shock. So to understand how these uh, occurs in real world, let us understand a <coughs> scenario here or an analogy. Uh, let us consider our body and the system, uh, the gas pump or the petrol station. Here, your vehicle is the patient or the tissue or the organs. The petrol or the gas is the volume. The pipe is the blood vasculature and gas pump is the heart. So first take, let us take what happens in hypovolemic shock. In hypovolemic shock, the blood itself is low or the intravascular volume is very low. That means the petrol itself is not there. So this can type it, this can cause a type of shock called hypovolemic shock. So what happens in case of a cardiogenic shock? That means the heart is not able to pump the enough blood. That means there is no the gas pump which is not working in the gas station so it is not able to pump the enough amount of petrol to your vehicle similarly the heart is not able to pump enough enough amount of blood so this can occur in cardiogenic shock so what happens in distributive kind of shock in distributive kind of shock for example in a petrol tank there is a separate a set of pipe which are working to put the petrol from the gas pump to the vehicle so if you put a very large pipe in this the petrol will not flow. So similarly, if there is a sudden vasodilatation occurring in your blood vessels, so there occurs sudden pooling of your uh, intravascular volume, which will ultimately lead to the uh, in increased vascular permeability and the tissue hypoxia. This is a type of shock which is called as the distributive kind of shock. And obstructive shock is as simple as you know, if the pipe is obstructed here, the petrol is not going to come. It similarly occurs in the body also. So. In the scenario, distributive shock is the most common type of shock. Here, there is a severe peripheral vasodilatation or a severe vascular leakage. Both can occur. So, this usually occurs in these kinds of shock. Receptic shock is the most common type of distributive shock. Then, CIRS due to any etiology. CIRS is a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Then, a neurogenic shock. Although some people consider a neurogenic shock as a type of separate shock, but neurogenic shock can be considered as a type of distributive shock. Then anaphylactic shock, then some drugs and toxin induced shock, then endocrine shock. Although endocrine shock is usually considered as a mixed type of shock, but you can consider it in the heading of distributive shock also because 
there is it is definitely not able to fit under hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, and obstructive shock. Why I'm mentioning this because is some textbook mention the endocrine shock in different category, neurogenic shock into different category, but for the practical purposes, the endocrine shock and the neurogenic shock are the parts of distributive shock, although they can have a mixed component working in them. The cardiogenic shock is uh, simple to understand. Here, there is a pump failure and the cause is intracardiac, which ultimately results in reduced cardiac output. So this can be uh, due to cardiomyopathic, where the uh, problem can be in the myocardium, problem can be in the vessels supplying the myocardium, problem can be in the valves. The arrhythmogenic, the electrical activity of the heart is abnormal and the mechanical. Then hypovolemic shock is again a very simple to understand. It is directly reduced intravascular volume. Either it is hemorrhagic or it is non-hemorrhagic. The patient might have bled. So this can be an external bleeding. This can be either internal bleeding or obscure bleeding. The non-hemorrhagic you know, can be due to severe diarrhea, severe vomiting, the burns, etc. Then the obstructive shock. Here it is a pump failure, but the cause is extra cardiac. So whether it, it, it can be either pulmonary vascular or it can be mechanical. We'll understand in the future. So when it comes to distributive shock, this is due to severe peripheral vasodilatation or a severe vascular leakage. So let us take one by one together here. Septic shock. We know and we discussed in the last class that it is a dysregulated host response to an infection causing life-threatening organ dysfunction. And it is overall the most common type of distributive shock with the mortality being very high, spotted a 50% of mortality. And again, the organism varies from population to population we discussed in the last class. Then what is CIRS? CIRS is a syndrome of robust inflammatory syndrome. There is a sudden uh, robust inflammatory stimulus occurring in the body. So the CIRS is not shock. Please remember this. CIRS is a vigilance. So what is CIRS? We discussed in the last class. Either tachycardia, tachypnea, increased or reduced temperature with increased leukocyte count. That means the white blood cells or the decreased platelets. So two out of four is considered as cells. So this is not a shock, but this is a vigilance where if you don't treat this, the patient will go into an overt shock. A very, very important thing. So here all it can occur. There is a sudden robust inflammatory syndrome occurs. It can occur in pancreatitis. It can occur in burns. It can occur in a hypoperfusion caused by a trauma. So understand this. The trauma, for example, the patients might have bled a lot. Along with this, there is a tissue compression or the uh, tissue death. So this can cause a severe robust inflammatory syndrome. A significant blunt trauma and crush injuries can cause this. And the amniotic fluid embolism, the fat embolism, the air embolism can cause this. So this are usually mentioned as a mixed type of shock. And this is also true in case of post-cardiac arrest syndrome. Like patient went into cardiac arrest, you're given a CPR, then you achieved the return of spontaneous circulation. So this is a very a risk category where due to the ischemia reperfusion injury, the patient can go into shock due to sudden robust inflammation occurring in the body. So CIRS, can cause a distributive kind of shock. Then a neurogenic shock. A neurogenic shock, you should understand, we know that the body is under a balance between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system basically causes vasoconstriction and parasympathetic nervous system causes the vasodilatation. And it is the balance between these two which is responsible for the normal heart rate and normal blood pressure. So what happens in neurogenic shock is there is a sudden interruption of the sympathetic nervous system pathway. So the vasoconstriction system collapses. So there is a sudden vasodilatation. 
causing reduced sudden peripheral vascular resistance. As I told you, this is a type of distributive shock. So this is what happens in case of neurogenic shock. So where all this occurs, this can occur in a severe traumatic brain injury and a spinal cord injury and spinal cord injury, especially the cervical plus upper thoracic injury can cause this. So this injury may not be associated with any physical damage to the spinal cord or the brain. If you see, if you get the MRI, it can be completely normal whereas patient can go into sudden type of shock. I think I'm sure that you have, uh, uh, you will overcome these type of patients, especially when you're managing trauma. <laughs> Many of the times the patient comes to you with a sudden drop in the blood pressure. The blood pressure is uh, 80 by 60. The patient does not have anything but had a history of trauma. He fell off from the vehicle. You get MRI, everything is normal. Uh, diffusal, uh, diffuse axonal injury is also not there, then you should suspect neogenic type of shock. However, please remember these patients are the traumatized patients, so they can be associated with the hypovolemia also, and in, the, in them, the myocardial depression may also contribute. So, why I am telling you this is the patient can be, uh, the patient can have the multiple causative factors in causing shock. Only after identifying the causes, you can treat these issues. Then anaphylactic shock, we know this is IgE mediated, sudden severe allergy reaction, in which there is an acute systemic reaction caused by the mediators of the mast cells. These are the histamine, the tryptase, and all these things gets released from the mast cells, which is mediated by IgE, can cause the shock called as anaphylactic shock. Then some drugs and toxin induced shock, especially the long acting narcotics, the snake bites and the insect bites can cause the patient to go into shock directly. The transfusion reactions can do, do this. The toxic shock syndrome caused by the staphylococcus aureus can cause this. The heavy metal poisoning can cause this. Then the endocrine causes, there are two endocrine causes of shock. One very important is the Addisonian crisis. Then a mixed edema shock. Uh, to perfectly say these are usually mixed type of shock, but for all the practical purposes, they are included under the distributive shock. So whereas if you take the uh, other causes of the shock, I will not be going with the each and every cause of the shock. The list is available in all the textbook. You can go ahead with this. So you should know to identify the patient in a early stage in the compensatory stage of the shock itself. When you identify the patient in a low blood pressure stage, that means the patient has already progressed from the compensatory phase to the progressive phase. This is very, very important. You should identify your patients in the compensatory phase itself. So that don't allow your patient to go into the progressive stage or else to go into the irreversible stage. In the compensatory phase, the patient's blood pressure can be normal or even it can be increased. Whereas they can have a heart rate of more than 100 or a tachycardia, they can have a tachypnea, the skin is cold and clammy, the urinary output is decreased much earlier than the hypertension, the mentation, the confusion appears much earlier than the drop in the blood pressure, again the respiratory alkalosis. due to tachypnea is a feature of early shock. A metabolic acidosis is a feature of late shock or a progressive shock. This can be the entrance question here. So how will you evaluate and initially approach your patient with undifferentiated hypotension and shock? <clears throat> so when you have a hypotension, it is very easy to identify. When you, when you don't have hypotension, you should know how to identify your patient in shock. So <clears throat> as I tell you, told you hypotension is not must. But you should know this hypotension can be absolute or this can be relative hypotension or this can be an extreme hypotension. So what is absolute hypotension? Absolute hypotension is invisible in front of you. The patient's blood pressure is 90 systolic or the mean arterial pressure of less than 65. 
the relative as i told you drop in blood pressure by more than 40 mm hg of systolic blood pressure the patient who had a chronic blood pressure of 160 yesterday he went into his routine checkup his blood pressure was 160 and it is 160 in his regular visits now he presented to you with blood pressure of 120 so this is also a hypotension but it is relative so here also you need to suspect the patient being in shock one of the very very important thing here then extreme the patient is in need of vasopressors so the absolute hypotension is very easy to identify the relative hypotension is difficult to identify you need to have a high suspicion for this then the next important thing is the tachycardia the tachycardia is very very important why because it is one of the early feature in a in a shock it can occur in early before developing hypotension in a patient but one thing you should identify here is whether your tachycardia is a cause of hypotension or a tachycardia is a response to the hypotension how will you identify whether you are seeking or you are, whether you seeing this tachycardia is a cause of this hypotension or a response to this hypotension the one basic formula which i follow is when the heart rate is more than 170 it is a cause of hypotension and it is not a response how you should know what happens when there is an increase in heart rate when there is an increase in heart rate your ventricles spend less time in diastole so there is a less time for filling so due to less filling there is less stroke volume so if heart rate goes on increasing your diastoles get shortened and since diastoles are shortened your heart is filled in diastole the filling is not occurring so the the stroke volume reduces and another another issue is you know that the, the hearts the myocardium is perfused during diastole all the organs in the body are perfused during systole only the myocardium is perfused during diastole so when the diastole time itself is less the perfusion to the myocardium time is also less so there occurs a myocardial ischemia this also contributes to the reduced stroke volume in your patient so the increasing heart rate is responsible to shock in the patient so and another issue is whenever the patient is having a different type of shock for example let me take a hypovolemic shock the patient had a severe diarrhea the patient passed more than 100 episodes of the loose stools in his 3 days he has lost almost his uh, body fluid so as a response to this is a compensatory response there is a sympathetic overactivity occurring in the patient which tries to increase the heart rate so this is considered as a response not the cause so you should know when to identify whether the patient's tachycardia is a cause of hypertension is a response to hypertension so this you should know there is a definite amount of uh, the increase in heart rate that a person can achieve what is the maximum heart rate that the person can achieve normally is 1 220 minus age so the younger age patients can achieve a little bit higher heart rate the older age patient achieve a little bit lesser heart rate for example if you take 80 year age male what is the uh, maximum heart rate that he can achieve as a response 220 minus 80 so it is 140 so when you see a patient of 80 year old his heart rate is 160 then suspect this is not the response this is the cause of hypertension one of the very very important thing here is so one basic rule which i practice is 170 if the patient's heart rate is more than 170 then it is usually due to tachycardia it is a cause of your hypertension and treat this you try to reduce this if it is less than 170 then it is a response to the hypertension then it is not the cause of hypertension except one thing which is called as atrial fibrillation in atrial fibrillation a type of tachycardia where the patient can have 
the decompensation even with a heart rate of 130 to 140. Why this occurs is, uh, you know that there is an atrial paralysis. So since the diastole is compromised in the heart, the active diastole is compromised by the increased heart rate and the passive diastole is also compromised by the atrial paralysis. Somebody need to uh, mute their screen. It's disturbing a lot. So you should know this about tachycardia. And what is about the oliguria? So we discussed about the hypertension here, then we discussed about the tachycardia here, then consider three things here. One is oliguria, the abnormal mental status, and the cold and skemisins thin. So this is called as the windows. These three together are considered as the windows of tissue perfusion. They are not doors, but they are windows. They give you some idea to look what is happening into the tissue perfusion. So you will be seeing three organs. One is skin, one is CNS, another one is the kidneys. So whenever the tissue perfusion is affected, you can see the external signs in these three organs. The skin manifests as the compensatory cutaneous vasoconstriction so that it mobilizes the amount of fluid from the skin to the very important organs. So due to compensatory vasoconstriction, there will be a uh, cold and clammy skin. This is a very, very important thing which usually occurs in shock. And this can occur even much before the patient develops the hypertension. Again, the CNS the altered perfusion. This is the last stage before the patient going into the hypertension because the brain is of the last organ which is being compromised here and the kidney is manifest by reducing the urine output. As I told you, these reduced in urine output can be seen much earlier than the hypertension, especially this is a very easy to see when the patient is in front of you in the ICU, you're monitoring the patient in a regular basis. He's perfectly normal. Now he's manifesting his hypertension. If you open his urine chart, the hypotension before appearing hypotension only for the last six, uh, five to six hours, the patient is having the reduced urine output, which is considered as less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour. That means the patient at least produce the half an ml of urine for your per kg per hour body weight. That means the 60 ml person should produce at least 60 kg patient at produce at least 30 ml of urine per hour. This is normal. So the windows of tissue perfusion are skin, the CNS, and the kidneys. Then the tachypnea. The tachypnea can also be the compensatory response here. And the tachypnea uh, alone can manifest as respiratory alkalosis in the early stage. When the tissue perfusion has been affected in the late stage, and the patient's uh, cells shift from the aerobic metabolism due to lack of oxygen to the anaerobic metabolism, then there occurs a generation of lactic acidosis. So this is a type of metabolic acidosis, which is usually seen in the late stage of shock. And again, the hyperlactatemia, so instead of measuring the acid load, you're measuring directly the lactate. So these are all uh, the suspicious features to identify that your patient is in shock. So hypertension is a late stage. If you see that your patient is in hypertension in shock, that means the significant amount of time you already lost, you need to be much aggressive in managing these kind of patients. And this is another uh, type of the external marker in case of shock. Uh, this is called as the mottling. This is especially true in a patient of septic shock. 
So this can be the feature of the shock. It's usually asked for the uh, MD uh, exams or the uh, DM exams. And the grading of shock is also very, very important. The coin stage is considered as grade one. If it's crossing knee joint, then it is considered as grade two. If it is up to mid thigh, then it is three. Up to groin is grade four. If it is crossing groin, then it is called as grade five. So this, this occurs also due to cutaneous vasoconstriction. And there is a controversy to call this as the libido reticularis, which is usually a feature of vasculitis. But some textbooks do consider the mottlings is similar to the uh, libido reticularis. Uh, let me not comment on this right now. So mottling is a feature of shock, especially the septic shock. Whenever you see this type of picture in your patient, please identify that he's in shock and he is in the need of urgent and aggressive management. And how I approach shock, if you want to uh, know, I go into post systematic step evaluation whenever I see or suspect shock. First, I look at the heart rate, then I look at the volume status. This is clinical plus the USG probe, then the cardiac performance, the 2D echo. Then, if, you, if all three are normal, then I suspect it is a systemic vascular resistance abnormal, and then it is a distributed shock. So, when a patient comes to me, with, I know. I want to know whether it is a severe bradycardia or a tachycardia. If there is a bradycardia, especially if your heart rate is very low, less than 50, less than 40, then you need to suspect there is abnormality in the heart itself. This happened uh, the day before yesterday only. There was a patient who was a 70-year-old male patient who was having a, a basal cell carcinoma, which was untreated, neglected, came to me in the evening 7 p.m. with a complaint of syncope. He had a syncope and this syncope occurred. The family attributed this to the death of his daughter. His daughter died in the morning. So he was in the uh, at the site of funeral, suddenly collapsed. Then they brought to us, his heart rate was 40. His blood pressure was around 80 by 60. The, everybody thought, this is, due, this is due to a vasovagal syncope due to extreme stress. But when we took ECG, the patient had an inferior volume MI with a complete heart block. Probably due to the right coronary artery 100% occlusion. And this patient was immediately referred. I put this patient on transcutaneous spacing. And after pacing, we went, we sent the patient to the cardiac unit. Uh, the patient could not survive. Uh, patient died on the angio lab. So this is this this these kinds of scenarios do exist in the routine time. Uh, the patients were reluctant to accept that he is in a case of myocardial infarction. Everybody is thinking that the patient is in uh, the vasovagal syncope stage. So initially they ha they had to refuse for the angio. We need to convince a lot. So, which took a lot of time, ultimately uh, losing the cardiac muscle. So, this is what happens. Uh, you should know this extreme bradycardia can also cause shock and the right treatment is important. You, you, you either go for the drugs to increase the heart rate or you need to go for the pacing, which is either the transcutaneous or the permanent pacemaker installation sometimes. And extreme heart rate, uh, the tachycardia, I know uh, and I have told you that uh, if it is a tachyarrhythmia, especially if it's a ventricular tachycardia, fibrillation, straight away you need to shock the patient. And if it is sinus tachycardia or if it is uh, extreme tachycardia, when it is atrial fibrillation, all these things you should understand uh, to know the heart rate. If it is normal and you understood that tachycardia is not the cause, it is the response, then you should assess the volume status. The volume status, first you try to assess it clinically if it is obvious. It's okay, treat the patient as hypovolemic shock. <clears throat> if the patient's uh, volume status is not obvious, then I want to look for the IVC, a very simple thing. If the IVC, the anterior posterior diameter is less than two centimeter, and if it is more than 50% collapsible, then the patient is, if, especially if the LV is hyperdynamic, then I consider the patient is fluid responsive, and then we need to just rush the fluid. 
or if the IVC is plethoric and if it is not compressible, then you suspect uh, some amount of obstruction, whether if the RV is obstructed, the tamponade is there, there's a massive PV, the asthmatic alveolar air trapping causing status asthmaticus, or the tension pneumothorax can cause a plethoric IVC, which is non compressible at all and not moving with the respiration. So, a very simple thing uh, to identify even for any of the person. I think the, many of the PGs might be sure. Uh, they might be practicing the IVC diameter. Although there are a lot of controversies, this is not good to assess the volume status, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But a very simple thing, everybody talks in theory, but practical, it is very difficult to uh, measure the exact uh, the variations of pulse pressure, especially when the patient is not mechanically ventilated. Uh, you need to have a lot of expertise in this. This IVC diameter is very simple to identify. Uh, with, even with a one-day training, everybody uh, tries to understand this. So if you're not practicing this, try to practice the IVC diameter observation in your emergency. If your hospital is not uh, especially having this, just go to the radiologist, then ask them to uh, teach you about this. This hardly takes two to three hours to learn the IVC uh, collapsibility and diameter estimation. <clears throat> then if the volume status is normal, uh, then you assess the uh, uh, co contraction of the heart or the type of cardiogenic shock. Get the ECG. If it is obvious in the ECG, it's okay. If it is no, then assess the eco, uh, assess the ejection fraction, eject, uh, assess the valvular uh, regurgitation, especially if it is occurring uh, acutely. So is volume truly going forward is a very important question. Whenever everything is normal, and you still suspect the cardiogenic shock in acute MR or an acute AR. In a patient of an acute myocardial infarction due to papillary muscle rupture or an acute infective endocarditis can present in a cardiogenic shock like this. If all these three are normal, if your echo is normal and your heart rate is okay, it is a response, you, there is no history of trauma or a hemorrhage and there is no obscure hemorrhage, there is no obstruction, then the last thing is the systemic vascular resistance droppage due to sudden severe vasodilatation. In this, you want to know whether it is a cervical spinal cord compression, you want to know whether it is an anaphylaxis, you want to know whether it is a sepsis, or you want to know it is a fulminant liver failure. If everything is normal, still the patient is in shock, then you need to suspect uh, the patients cannot utilize the oxygen. It can be the mitochondrial poisoning, the cyanide or shock, the carbon monoxide. But what you should never miss in the early stages, these amount of ECGs. To see this ECG, there is an ST elevation in one AVL with V1, V2, V3, V4. So there is an anterior lateral ST elevation with a massive sharp pinning. So these patients can have the cardiogenic shock. So in this, the patient can, if in cardiogenic shock, they are considered as clinic four and their mortality is very, very high. Their 30 day mortality is more than 40%. Around 150 to 160. And if you see, there is a beat to beat variation. One large beat, one slow beat, one large beat, one small beat, one large beat, one small beat. So this is called as an electrical alternance. So electrical alternance is a feature of the massive pulmonary, sorry, massive pericardial effusion or the cardiac tamponant. A very, very important thing you might have to do an emergency pericardio centesis in this patient. The cardiologists don't want these kind of patients. Being the physicians, you need to identify these patients. Being the emergency medicine, you need to identify these patients. Just by putting the catheter, uh, you can withdraw the amount of the fluid which is compressing the heart. So the ECG is very, very important here. And another one you might have heard, the Bex triad. I will not go into detail to identify the cardiac tamponade here. Then, uh, if you want to understand this ECG, there is slight amount of tachycardia, heart rate is around 100. This little axis, it is a right axis deviation. Then, if you see the STT changes, there is a T wave inversion, similarly, two 
example v1 if you can identify there is a tall r wave in v1 so there is a right ventricular strain occurring in this patient along with this there is significant amount of s1 q3 t3 so everybody might have learned this s1 q3 t3 by now are very famous among all the medicine pgs and the in ugs were interested in ecg is a non specific and non sensitive feature of massive pulmonary embolism so the ecg signs in the pulmonary embolism are very very important what is the most common sign the most common sign is the sinus tachycardia this is the only true thing s1 q3 t3 is not the most specific sign so what happens in pulmonary embolism is very very important the pulmonary embolism if, especially if it is massive the right ventricle is under strain the right ventricle is not able to pump the right ventricle is very very weak person it cannot generate a systolic pressure of more than 40 mmhg unlike these your left ventricle right ventricle is very weak so if you put an obstruction in the pathway of right ventricle outflow tract the right ventricle suddenly fails so this causes a sudden right ventricular dilatation so due due to this dilatation there occurs a shift in the axis which is manifested as right axis and there occurs due to dilatation there occurs a restricted perfusion to the right ventricular myocardium which manifested as the t wave inversions in the anterior precordial leads which can progress from v1 to v2 v3 v4 etc so the precordial t wave inversions in a patient of an acute chest pain <coughs> you should suspect the acute pulmonary thromboembolism in fact this rv strain developing acutely which is being manifested as the t wave inversions in v1 to v4 plus if it is there in the lead 3 also this is actually considered as the specific sign for the acute right ventricular strain for this the most common cause is the massive pulmonary embolism a very very important thing here and this right ventricular strain the s1 q3 t3 pattern uh, which is also a feature of right ventricular strain or also called as an acute cor pulmonary is i told you they are not specific so that means there are other causes of the acute cor pulmonary also you should know what are the other causes of acute cor pulmonary indeed in s1 q3 t3 so they are status asthmaticus ARDS and attention pneumothorax. Why I am mentioning this is nowadays everybody knows S1 Q3 T3. So the examiners have moved forward. They are asking the differential diagnosis of S1 Q3 T3. So you should know the differential diagnosis of an acute cor pulmonary. The acute cor pulmonary. The only cause is not massive pulmonary embolism. So it is the, the it can occur in status asthmaticus. It can occur in the <coughs> tension pneumothorax and it can occur in ARDS also so you should know this the s1 q3 t3 sign is also called as macgin fight sign i'm going a little bit deeper in the ecg because nowadays the undergraduates have also focused themselves have also focused uh put them uh, themselves into the understanding of ecg so it is very important to understand that all s1 q3 t3 is not is not pulmonary embolism you should suspect this only in the clinical context and uh, in the patient who have other features of the other ecg features of the pulmonary embolism especially the sinus tachycardia if there is no sinus tachycardia and still the patient is s1 q3 t3 then it's very unlikely to be a pulmonary embolism and what is this ecg the patient was perfectly normal here in the sinus rhythm suddenly he progressed into a broad complex tachycardia so what is this it is ventricular tachycardia what is ventricular tachycardia 
more than three successive VPCs with rate of more than 100 is called as ventricular tachycardia. Although it is in sustained here, if it is sustained for 30 seconds, then it is called sustained VT. If it is sustained for less than 30 seconds, then it is called ill sustained VT. So it is an ill sustained VT. So these are kinds of shock. When the patient is having an absolute shock, you come to the emergency, you see the patient, patient is lying, he just came to be, just came to the emergency who had a history of old infarction, who had decompensated heart, now presented with sudden palpitation and syncope. She fell off. Then you look at the monitor, heart rate is around 140, 150. You get the ECG, you get this broad, broad complex tachycardia. The first thing you will do is the DC shock. Even if you give amiodarone, lignocaine, nothing will work when the patient is in cardiogenic shock in the background of ventricular tachycardia. So these patients has to be undertaken for the DC shock, which can bring out a dramatic response. So how you are going to manage your patients of shock? The first is always first. First, you are going to secure the airway. Then you assess the breathing and treat it and the circulation. So the first priority is to stabilize the airway and the breathing with the oxygen. And if at all you need the mechanical ventilation, you should consider it when is necessary. And a patient with respiratory distress and marked hemodynamic instability are typically intubated. Don't wait for the patient. If you receive the patient, patient is not able to breathe. The patient's airways collapse. The patient had a history of trauma. His a lot of secretions are available, and the patient is in absolute shock. Don't put the patient just an oxygen mask. You need to intubate the patient if you really want to save this patient. And get the IV access very fast. Get the initial peripheral venous access with the 14 or 18 18 gauge, etc. If it is not possible, get the intraosseous access. The medicine PGs should be able to get the intraosseous access during any time. Then this resuscitative efforts, particularly the intravenous feeds, they should not be delayed at the cost of the rapid clinical assessment. Don't wait for the long history to take. Don't uh, worry that the uh, consultant will come to you tomorrow. He will ask you what is the past history, what is the family history, what is the vaccination history. All this can be taken after a few hours stabilizing the patient. So don't wait to start the management here. Simultaneously assess the obvious causes. So, and the next thing is the risk stratification. If you are, uh, if you are stabilized with airway and breathing, your circulation, you have got the vascular access. Now stratify this patient according to the severity of the shock. You should know when to identify the shock. And the patient obvious history is available in front of you. He bled in front of you or in the road. It is obvious. When it is no, get the ECG, do the bedside telemetry, identify the uh, shock, put the patient in monitor, see the heart rate. All these things that I have told you in the uh, last few uh, 20 minutes you should do. The patients with milder forms of shock or critically ill patients who have been stabilized, they can undergo thorough diagnostic evaluation. Okay. Uh, you can get the eco, you can get the careful history, you can ask the patient to get old report, etc. But among this, you should identify the conditions which require urgent interventions. Don't wait anything for these um, uh, types of patients to wait for the reports to come. What are these? The first and foremost is anaphylactic shock. A very, very important thing. How will you suspect anaphylactic shock? Patients usually have the skin manifestations, like the patient, uh, sudden, you know, for example, there is a history of an insect bite. Suddenly after an insect bite, patients started to have sudden itching with an arctic area, with or without angioedema. Patient might have GI manifestations. Patient can have the uh, diarrhea, vomiting, etc. Along with this, the respiratory manifestations due to sudden severe bronchospasm and a severe vasodilatation due to sudden stimulation of the mast cells and releasing the vasodilator mediators can cause the patient to go into shock. So the strong suspicion when the hypotension occurs in the presence of a sudden onset inspiratory stridor, the oral or facial edema or the hives that is an arterial rashes uh, takes towards you 
to the anaphylactic shock. So what will you do when you see the patient of anaphylactic shock? The first thing you do is put the patient in supine position with the foot end elevated, give the adrenaline. The first thing is adrenaline. A very, very important intervention that you do. I have seen many postgraduates first administering the uh, nebulization, first giving hydrocort, first giving methylprednisone. No, when you are seeing the patient of anaphylactic shock, first thing you do is an intramuscular adrenaline of one in 1000 dilution of adrenaline, you give 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 ml. A very safe technique, you need not fear to give adrenaline here, especially when the patient is in anaphylactic shock, a very life-saving entity. Sometimes you may need two to three doses of uh, this adrenaline injection. If it is not able to recover, then you can get the patient on adrenaline infusion also. Then after giving adrenaline, you can start the patient on H1 and H2 blockers, the nebulized, nebulized albuterol for the bronchodilatation and the methylprednisolone to further inhibit the uh, mast cell release, you can achieve this. But uh, the first thing and the foremost thing is important to do is the intramuscular adrenaline with the 1 is to 1000 dilution 0.3 to 0.5 ml. Sometimes you get the free filled syringes, but usually it is uh, very difficult to uh, get in India. So every ward should have a free filled adrenaline syringe. In my casualty, the first thing the nursing staff checks is the free filling adrenaline syringe whether they have uh, made it and kept ready for that day or not. So this is how we should practice. Then the tension pneumothorax, you should, uh, one of the uh, condition causing the uh, obstructive shock, uh, which needs an urgent intervention, you should suspect when there is a tachypnea, the unilateral pleuritic chest pain, the diminished breath sounds and the distended neck veins and the tracheal deviation away, the sudden increase in the pulse pressure in the mechanical ventilation. So it's a, one of the uh, uh, condition where you can identify this uh, particular issue on only clinical examination if you are experienced enough. Just by observing the chest and trachea, you can identify whether the patient is in tension pneumothorax or not. So the first thing you will do is the needle decompression. So everybody of you know that whenever somebody mentions you that there is a needle de uh, decompression, it is done in tension pneumothorax. Or whenever somebody mentions tension pneumothorax, you need to do needle compression. I don't know how many of you have done needle decompression. The guidelines, even the present ATLS guidelines tells you to do the needle decompression at the second intercostal space in the mid clavicular line. But there are a lot of controversies in this issue due to the site is very difficult to identify rapidly and the pleura or the pleural space is difficult to obtain in this particular site. So nowadays there has been a change. The many of the people are approaching uh, to the site of thoracostomy directly. So they are doing the needle decompression in the anterior axillary line, either in the fourth or fifth intercostal space. For all the exam purposes, it is still the second intercostal space. But what you should know for the emergency purposes for the medical uh, postgraduates working in the medical emergency, if you are putting your needle in the second eye intercostal space and if you are not able to achieve the desired thing, then change the site of needle to fourth or fifth intercostal space very rapidly. Don't wait for the patient or don't <coughs> doubt your clinical judgment. If you if you judge that patient is in tension pneumothorax, if you put the second intercostal space needle, then the air is not coming out. Then don't think that probably I'm wrong. The patient is, does not have tension pneumothorax, etc. Just try to put the needle in the anterior axillary line in the fourth or fifth intercostal space, the place where we usually put the ICD. So after doing needle decompression, the patient may need the acute thoracostomy for some duration. Then another emergency uh, intervention requiring type of shock is the pericardial tamponade. Uh, where usually the patient is having severe dyspnea with a tachypnea, the hypertension, the JVP is raised with the pulses paradoxes. 
A very, very important thing. If I'm the examiner for all the undergraduates and postgraduates, I will definitely asking this question, how to demonstrate pulses paradoxes. I will not be asking the causes of pulses paradoxes. Everybody asks causes of pul pulses paradoxes. Nobody in medical profession teaches you how to measure pulses paradoxes. So I want uh, those interested candidates to contact me uh, and to answer me uh, how to measure pulses paradoxes and try to measure in the routine practice, make it a habit. Whenever the patient, at least whenever the patient complains of dyspnea, try to measure the pulses paradoxes. And in, if at all you identify the uh, pericardial tampon, and you can see the pericardial fluid here, and you can see this right ventricle, which is compressed by the fluid, diamond sign of right ventricle. So in this, you may need an emergency pericardiosynthesis, where you're putting the needle at 30 degree, the subcostal space directly at the left midclavicular line. And a life-threatening arrhythmia. If the patient is having life-threatening arrhythmia, if there's a tachyarrhythmia, the first thing you do is a DC cardioversion. Very, very important thing. All the undergraduates in their internship in the medicine uh, casualty should learn to do a DC cardioversion. A very important life-saving procedure. Then if there's a bradyarrhythmia, try to give atropine or isoprenolol. isoprenolol. If it is not working, go for either adrenaline infusion. Still, it's not working. You may need a temporary or the permanent pacemaker. <laughs> After stabilizing these patients initially, then identifying these all emergency conditions, then appears the initial diagnostic evaluation. Then you do a bedside evaluation and the laboratory evaluation and the imaging and the pulmonary artery catheterization earlier time to measure the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. What's considered as the uh, part and parcel of the shock assessment or the approach. Nowadays, it is not routinely used. So in the clinical initial evaluation, you will get the good history, assess for the signs of dehydration, look at the CVS, RS and CNS, for the cause and effect assessment, then start from treatment. Then sometimes the patient may need bedside echocardiogram. Uh, it is should be done in all patients of shock. Please understand this. Then identify the rhythm disturbances, the STT changes, the pericardial effusion and pulmonary embolism. Then assessment of the etiology done after stabilization and it needs practice. For the laboratory evaluation, it should be performed early in the evaluation. You identify the cause of the shock and you assess the amount of organ failure in your patient. So what are the tests we usually perform is serum lactate, the complete metabolic panel, including the kidney and the liver function tests, the cardiac enzymes and the natriuretic peptides, the CBC and the differential count, the coagulation studies and the D-dimer level and the blood gas analysis. Then after this, try to obtain the chest radiography if the cause is not evident. Other images directed at the etiologic shock. For example, if the patient had a history of shock, uh, present with shock, the history of trauma, no external bleeding, try to get the intra, uh, sorry, USG abdomen to measure any intraoperative bleeding is occurring or not, like this. <laughs> and pulmonary embolism is suspecting if your radiography is normal, you are not sure of the ECG, then you can get the CT angio immediately to diagnose this patient. So imaging is directly at the suspected etiology. Then some point of care USG needs to be done. The heart, you need to assess the pericardium, the LV, RV, IVC, along with this, the valve changes. You're, you're not going to assess the uh, severity of mitral stenosis, uh, et cetera, here. You are just assessing the point of care USG here. This is not a full-fledged uh, echo. You are assessing whether the blood is actually moving forward or not. So. Uh, the acute regurgitations are need to be identified along with the myocardial, uh, the pericardium abnormalities in a case of cardiogenic shock. Then point of care USG, especially the fast, the focused assessment sonography in trauma needs to be done to assess the chest and abdomen and the major vessels uh, to identify their bleeding, their abdominal aortic uh, rupture is there or not, etc. Uh, the pulmonary catheter, uh, artery catheterization, as I told you, it has fallen out of favor. This you can consider in the evaluation in the due course when the cause is not clear. 
So after identifying all this, your target is to maintain the mean arterial pressure at 65 to 70 mmHg. And another thing I forgot to mention in case of uh, the tachycardia is the shock index. Shock index is a ratio of the heart rate to the systolic blood pressure. I will give an example. A patient of 30-year-old female comes to you with a history of fever. Is Her heart rate is 100. Her blood pressure is 90. So if you calculate the shock index in her, 100 by 90 is 0.9. So what is normal shock index? The normal shock index is 0.5 to 0.7. So rather than going for the individual heart rate or SBP assessment, you can take the shock index to identify the patient at a much earlier time. So whenever the patient crosses this 0.7 of shock index, you need to be very, very careful uh, before developing the irreversible stage of shock or going into the actual hypotension in your patient. So very, very important thing is the shock and index. This can be the question. And nowadays, the, another entity has come, which is called as modified shock index, in which the ratio of heart rate is taken to the mean arterial pressure rather than the systolic blood pressure. This may come in future. This has been particularly assessed in a patient of an acute myocardial infarction in predicting the mortality. For whole trauma patients in emergency medicine, we don't know uh, yet about the modify, uh, modify shock index assessment or the workout. The shock index is definitely uh, practiced everywhere, especially in a patient of uh, the trauma care. So how you are going to achieve this hemodynamic support to maintain the mean arterial pressure of 65 to 70 by two means, either the intravenous fluids or the vasopressor, sometimes both. So intravenous fluids, uh, in the last two classes, I've taken you know, enough about the intravenous uh, fluids. Uh, the first line agents, especially uh, in the patients when they come with the undifferentiated hypertension and shock. Uh, whenever you see a patient of undifferentiated hypertension and shock, the first thing you order is put the cannula and put some IV fluid. This is very, very important. And last two, two classes, I have focused this very important thing is, please administer the IV fluids in a well-defined boluses at the discrete intervals with regular reassessment. Very, very important thing. And how much volume is actually required is actually determined by the type of the shock and type of the patient. In the comment section of the last two classes, I have got uh, the comments uh, telling, sir, kindly mention how much fluid to give, how much fluid to give. See, none of the textbook or none of the teacher can mention you how much to give. How much to give is always individualized. You cannot tell one liter here, two liter here, 1.5 liter here. This is absolutely wrong. Even if the textbook is mentioning, it is absolutely wrong because each patient is different. Each shock is different. You need to assess the volume. Uh, the best way to do is give it in a well-defined bonus. You find it ML, check BP, check, reassess the patient. Give another 500 ml, give another 500 ml, and when you require more than 2 liters, don't give NS, go for RL. Uh, and nowadays, the balanced salt, salt solutions are also coming into the picture. So, as I told you, the volume of the uh, given to be determined by type, type of the shock and type of the patient. So, if you see the patient of obstructive shock, uh, for example, from the pulmonary embolism and cardiogenic shock from the myocardial infarction, these may require usually a very small volumes or no volume is required at all. Sometimes a small 500 ml can be given even if the patient is in a cardiogenic shock, but the fluid is not the very important thing here. That is not that is what you should understand here. Whereas if the patient is having a, a hypovolemic shock, yes, the patient may need a very high amount of IV fluids, especially if the patient, patient is having a hemorrhagic shock, there may be a need of blood products. What about the middle patient? When you don't know the cause, your cardiogenic shock is not obvious. There is no obstruction that you have proved. Uh, the heart is okay, definitely the patient can able to manage, then you can often give two to five liters, again, in a well-defined boluses with a regular reassessment. This is what is a final comment on IV fluids. Three ml per hour, four ml per hour, all these, uh, when they mention, it is very, very 
uh, what do you call uh, uh, gross thing. You cannot uh, apply it to the regular patients in front of you. If you actually, uh, when the patient is in shock, be it a dengue, be it a pancreatitis, uh, be it a burns, you need to spend a lot of time with the patient if you want to actually treat. Just spend time on the bedside. This is very much possible in your PG, PG times. So if you learn in during PG times, when you come out of PG, then become it becomes very, very easy what to do and what not to do. Spending time on the bedside is very, very important. Next, after the IV fluids in the shock, uh, there comes a role of the inotropes and vasopressors. Let me uh, take this concept uh, clearly here. The inotropes and the vasopressors are not similar things. The inotropes are the drugs that increase the cardiac contractility. That means they cause the positive inotropy. Whereas what are the vasopressors? They are the drugs that induce a potent vasoconstriction. So if the patient, for example, if the patient is having a cardiogenic shock, the patient is not able to contract. If you give this patient the vasopressors, what will happen is the patients will collapse. Due to a sudden severe vasoconstriction, there is an increased systemic vascular resistance. Heart itself is not able to pump now. Now you are increasing the afterload. The heart will give away. And similarly, when the patient is having a shock or a septic, septic shock, which is a kind of distributive shock in the vasodilatation, where you cannot give the <coughs> dubutamine. Dubutamine is a positive inotropic effect. And it also causes vasodilatation because it is a beta 2 stimulating agent. So beta 2 causes vasodilatation. So there is a further drop in the blood pressure. So you need to give a vasoconstriction in this stage. So to, to know which type of uh, uh, the agent uh, you want, you, know, you want to know which type of shock is there. That's why it's very, very important to identify the shock. So inotrope is a drug which increases the cardiac contractility. Vasopressor is a drug which causes vasoconstriction in elevating the mean arterial pressure by elevating the systemic vascular resistance. So to identify these and to understand this, the understanding of the receptor is very, very important. I will not go in deep. You might have studied all this. The alpha receptors are classified as alpha 1 and alpha 2. Alpha 2 is not important for us because it is presynaptic to a terminal transmission. Alpha 1 is a potent vasoconstriction receptor. <clears throat> so uh, the pneumonic here is one. It is present in the uh, blood vessels. It is present in the neck of the bladder and prostate. It is present in the eye. So important for us is the blood vessels in which it causes vasoconstriction. What about beta? The beta 1 is there in the heart and some amount in kidneys. So in beta 1, try to increase the contractility of the heart rate. And beta 2 is a smooth muscle relaxation. So it causes bronchodilatation. It causes vasodilatation. <coughs> then it causes the bladder rate relaxation, etc. So how will you identify this? And the beta 1, there is one heart, that's why it's situated in the heart. The beta 2, there are two, recept there are two lungs in your body, that's why beta 2 acts on the lungs. This is just a pneumonic kind of thing. I think it should not be necessary at this level to know where the beta 1 acts and beta 2 acts. So to summarize what is the mechanism of action here is, if you look at the phenylephrine, it is a potent vasoconstrictor. So it increases the cardiac uh, sorry, systemic vascular resistance, but it usually does not have any effect on the cardiac output because it is a pure vasoconstrictor, acts only on alpha-1 receptor, does not act on beta-1 or beta-2. Whereas if you take the norepinephrine, it is a very important vasopressor, but a very weak inotrope. If you take the adrenaline, it is also a vasoconstrictor, but a little bit uh, having a much able uh, capacity to increase the cardiac contractility compared to the norepinephrine. So whenever you want both the mechanism of action, epinephrine fits very, very well. A dopamine nowadays is out of sight. Nobody using dopamine. And if you're still using the dopamine, you are absolutely wrong. The dobutamine and mildrenone we usually use in a patient of cardiogenic shock. They usually have a very uh, uh, 
less effect on the systemic vascular resistance, whereas they are predominantly agents which induces the myocardial contractility. This is another slide to identify where the uh, uh, these actually fits. So to know which a drug acts on which system. The phenylephrine, as I told you, it is a pure vasoconstrictor, acts only on alpha 1, does not have any action on other receptors. So it tends to increase your systemic vascular resistance. So when you want the systemic vascular resistance to increase, you want phenylephrine. So the question is why phenylephrine has not become famous in a septic shock? This is because since it is a vasoconstricting agent, this can cause ischemic phenomena with an increasing dosage. That's why it is uh, it has not become popular. Another issue that uh, appears in sepsis is, along with the vasodilatation, uh, I have told you in the last class that there is also a myocardial dysfunction occurring in the late stage of septic shock. That's why we want a drug which have both mechanisms of action, which, which, which has a predominant vasoconstrictor action, and although uh, that should have a little cardiac positive inotropic effect also. So the best drugs in this category are the epinephrine and the norepinephrine. So they have a potent alpha-1 activity in causing vasoconstriction with some amount of beta activity. So among the norepinephrine and epinephrine, as I have told you that it is an epinephrine which has got uh, a little bit of uh, the positive inotropic effect uh, much higher than the norepinephrine and also a little bit of vasodilation effect whenever at the higher dose. If you give noradrenaline uh, higher dose, Instead of vasoconstriction, it causes vasodilatation due to simultaneous stimulation of the beta 2 receptor. The dopamine, as we earlier discussed, uh, in the early low dose, we used to uh, consider that it, it, it induces the uh, renal vasodilatation so that it is very important to perfuse the kidneys. Nowadays, the concept is not at all followed. The dobutamine is a drug which has got a potent beta 1 activity. So it is a very important drug in inducing the cardiac contractility. So uh, to go for the drugs here, the noradrenaline, the dosage is, please understand, it is 0.05 to 0.15 microgram per kg per minute. All the PZs should know this. Nobody knows this actually. They just know how to ad advise the system. They just advise, give two ampule in 46 ml of NS, put the infusion pump 4 ml per hour, etc. This is a very wrong thing. You should know how to calculate the dosage also. So it is the usual vasopressor of choice in all types of shock, I can say. So it is the usual vasopressor of choice in septic. In fact, it is a very important in cardiogenic shock and hypolemic shock also. And if you see actually the doses of the uh, noradrenaline from textbook, textbook, it may vary. But it usually uh, considered as 0.05 to 0.15 microgram per kg per minute. So it, I have given you the uh, composition here. Whenever you see the noradrenaline vial, check whether it is a concentrated or a titrated issue. Whenever it is a concentrated, that means every ml contains 1 mg. If it is titrated, that means they mention that 2 ml contains 1 mg, whereas it is, uh, since it is a titrated, this also contains 1 ml, 1 mg. So for all the practical purposes, 1 ml of noradrenaline contains 1 milligram. A must remember thing. Next question is uh, uh, it has been asked by many of the uh, students. So I will tell you how to how, will, how I calculate the noradrenaline dose advice. So, what is the dose I require? For example, 0 0.05 microgram per kg per minute. And what concentration I have is 1 ml is equal to 1 mg. So <clears throat> So I have decided to start the patient on 0.5 microgram per kg per minute. So how will I calculate this? So for a 60 year old, 60 kg patient, 60 kg into 0.05 is three. So it is three microgram per minute. So how usually I prepare is put 2 ampule of 2 mg. If it is 2 mg, you should know what is the dosage. 
If you are putting two ampule of one ml, then you are putting two ml. If you are putting two ampule of two ml, then you are putting four ml. So we usually put four ml plus forty six ml of either five percent dextrose or NS. So whatever the IV fluid here is. So here the concentration becomes the fifty ml of this preparation contains four mg. That is four thousand microgram of noradrenaline so how much does 1 ml contains so 1 ml contains 4000 divided by 50 80 so 1 ml contains 80 microgram of noradrenaline so how much noradrenaline i want for a 60 kg patient so i want 3 kg 3 microgram per minute Per minute, I want 3 microgram. Per hour, I want 3 into 60. I want 180 microgram. So my concentration here is 1 ml contains 80 microgram. So I want 180. So I usually advise 2.5 ml per hour infusion. So if you start the patient by putting 4 ml of noradrenaline in 46 ml of IV fluid in infusion pump and advise them to give 2.5 ml per hour, then it usually becomes 0 0.5, 0 0.05 to 0 0.06 microgram per kg per minute. Then you can go on increasing the dose. Similarly, you should know the, uh, you can calculate the adrenaline dose as I've given you. The dose here is 1 to 15 microgram per minute or 0 0.01 to 0 0.02 microgram per kg per minute. You either remember microgram per minute or microgram per kg per minute. Don't try to remember both. I usually remember point micro uh, microgram per kg per minute. So for noradrenaline, it's 0 0.05 to 0.15. And for, for noradrenaline, it's 0 0.01 to 0 0.02. So if you consider 0.1 microgram, it holds good for both. So uh, adrenaline is the initial vasopressor of choice in anaphylactic shock. And it is typically considered as the add-on in the agent to the norepinephrine in septic shock. And the additional agent is required to rise the MAP. And it usually increases the heart rate. Sometimes very dangerous to induce a tachyarrhythmia and ischemia because it has a potent beta-1 activity, as I told you. And for inotropy, if you want the adrenaline, you should go for the higher end of the suggested range. You should go for the 0.2 microgram per kg per minute. And sometimes since it is, it is due to vaso, it, it causes vasoconstriction, it causes some elevation in the lactate during the initial administration. That's why you cannot use the lactate clearance goal when you are putting the patient on adrenaline. And very be very careful in assessing the mesenteric perfusion here. Then the dopamine is usually used as 2 to 20 microgram per kg per minute. It is an alternative to uh, septic shock in highly selected patients. For example, if you want uh, tachycardia in your patient, patient has a bradycardia uh, and uh, patient is low risk of tachyarrhythmia, you can have this patient uh, dopamine. And there are more adverse effects with the dopamine. Uh, you should be very, very careful. Lower days, uh, initially we used to use a lower dose. Uh, to have a renal protective effect is not definitely used because it can cause hypotension during the weaning off. So dopamine is usually not used nowadays in wherever you go. And again, dopamine, dobutamine is the initial agent of choice in a cardiogenic shock with a low cardiac output and a maintained blood pressure. For example, a decompensated chronic heart failure, a patient of a dilated cardiomyopathy with a baseline ejection fraction of 20%, comes to you with a decompensated cardiogenic shock, then you can put the patient on dobutamine. You can add the norepinephrine uh, for the cardiac output augmentation if the patient also has sepsis in the background. And it will be important to remember that it is a drug which increases the car cardiac contractility and the rate and has a slight vasodilatation effect. So it can cause hypertension and tachy arrhythmias. And the vasopressin has now come into the picture, especially in a patient of septic shock, but it is never a first line. 
Why? Because it is a potent vasoconstrictor, can cause mesenteric ischemia and also can cause myocardial ischemia. So it is usually used as an add or agent to the norepinephrine requirement. So this is all about the shock. Uh, to summarize here, the shock is uh, very important to identify the patient in shock. Next, try to identify which type of shock. Uh, the 60% of the time, with your basic knowledge, you can identify the type of the shock without any investigation. Sometimes you may need an investigation or an imaging. And even after evaluation, some percent may remain undiagnosed with the cause. For this, you may need an extensive evaluation and a use of multidisciplinary team. You want to take some questions here. I've got two important questions here. This actually appeared in the NEET SS. So what is true about neurogenic shock? Tachycardia, the patient has cold and moist extremities. It is due to parasympathetic cutoff and mostly due to high spinal injuries. So as I told you, neurogenic shock, there is a balance between systemic, sorry, sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. And the balance is lost here due to sudden drop in the sympathetic output by overflow of parasympathetic nervous system activity. So here, there is a vasodilatation. So it is due to parasympathetic cutoff. is definitely false. It is due to sympathetic cutoff. They have asked true reason here. Tachycardia. We usually see a bradycardia in a patient of neurogenic shock. As I told you, parasympathetic nervous system causes bradycardia. So tachycardia is a false. The patient has cold and moist extremities. As this is true due to cutaneous vasodilatation, the peripheries are moist. It occurs due to high spinal injuries. Yes, it is right. It usually rare in case of low spinal injuries. It mostly occurs due to high spinal injuries. Then shock with the lower mortality rate, I have mentioned this, is a hypovolemic shock. If the question appears shock with the higher mortality rate and the options are similar, I don't know the answer yet. Because some studies mention the cardiogenic shock as the highest mortality, some mention obstructive shock as the highest mortality, some mention septic shock. So I don't think there is a question coming with the shock with the highest mortality rate, but shock with lowest mortality rate is definitely hypovolemic shock. Thank you. Uh, that's all for the uh, shock. Uh, in the critical care section, uh, we'll try to finish the ERDS and if possible about the uh, assessment of the uh, CNS uh, emergency. If any questions, there are no questions, then you can uh, say goodbye here. Sir, uh, in uh, YouTube, they have asked a question about, uh, uh, they have asked you to explain the norepinephrine equivalence. Norepinephrine? Equivalence. Norepinephrine equivalence. Yes, sir. No. Sir, hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Norepinephrine. Uh, yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Norepinephrine equivalence. Okay. No, no, I have not heard this terminology. Maybe I need to go back to this. Okay, sir. And uh, no more doubts, sir. Okay. So, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you so much, sir, for taking uh, so much uh, useful classes for us. And uh, Hoping to see you in the other session. Thank you, everyone.